my name is Kira Haugen and I am the general manager of Norwegian Chamber of Commerce and together with the uh, Finnish Chamber of Commerce, the Danish UK Association, we are welcome you, welcoming you to HR Matters by Goodwill. A uh, couple of things. Uh, the video will be turned off for everyone and also the, the, everyone will be muted throughout the session. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and posted. Uh, and if there's any questions at all during the presentations, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom and you will uh, and we take the question at the end. Any technical queries on the way, please let us know also uh, under the Q&A feature. Now I will give the uh, word back to Anna and Jackie who will run through the, um, the webinar video. Thank you. So thank you, Kiri. Um, yes, I, I have just tried my video and that's not working as well. So apologies, everyone. Um, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, as mentioned by Kiri, um, my name is Jackie and uh, I'm the HR manager at Goodwill. Um, Anna is also one of the HR advisors on my team and we'll both be speaking today. Uh, so today we'll be focusing on what you must do as an SME in the UK, um, but also considerations that you should make when thinking about uh, what you would like to, to make as an attractive option as an employer in the UK um, and what sort of things will help you with this um, and will help you to attract top talent, to retain your talent and generally improve your employer brand. Um, of course, we will also be updating you on the new employment legislation changes to happen recently. So about Goodwill. Um, Goodwill was founded back in 1997 by Annika Goodwill. For more than 20 years, we have offered essential business services for companies who are looking to enter, grow or scale in the UK. Um, all of these services are, are offered under one roof um, and they encompass five departments, which are corporate legal, finance, HR, payroll and virtual office. We pride ourselves on, allow, on allowing our clients to focus on the things that bring value to their business, knowing that the other tasks are in safe hands. So as mentioned, uh, today you'll be hearing from myself and Anna from the Goodwill HR department, uh, where we have years of experience in assisting Nordic and other overseas companies with their HR needs. You can see from the slide that some of the core areas that we help with um, are of asked. However, in summary, we deal with the full life cycle of an employee from recruitment to termination and everything in between. Um, I'll pass you over to Anna now, who will tell you about recent employment law changes to take place. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Jackie. As Jackie man mentioned, we would like to start off with recent changes in the UK employment law and the good work plan, which has brought us several employment law changes that you need to ensure are applied to in your organization. Firstly, there has been some changes to contracts of employment. There has been extension of the entitlement to receive a statement of written particulars on basic employment terms and conditions to include workers as well as employees. Receiving such statement was made at that day one right, and prior to that, employees used to have up to two months to provide the contract, while now you have to provide it by the day one of the employment at the latest. Contracts have to include more information now as well, such as benefits and mandatory training. You have to be very careful with wording, as we don't want to make the benefits contractual, although you have to provide enough information about them, and you have to make sure that they are included in the contract from now on. If you are not, not found to be compliant with that, penalties can be as high as two to four weeks compensation, and there is a higher risk if, for example, an employee did not pass the probation period. There has also been pay changes. Firstly, there has been an abolition of Swedish derogation, meaning that agencies will no longer be able to avoid paying agency workers the same pay as employees for doing the same job. That change was basically equalized because workers, it provides them with increased stability and certainty nowadays. There has also been a change in the reference period for establishing average week's pay. It used to be 12 weeks, while now it's going to be 20, 52 weeks, sorry. 
The reform is intended to improve the holiday pay for seasonal workers who tend to lose out over the way it was currently calculated. Minimum wage has also been brought up as of 1st of April, like each year. There has been a lot of discussion amongst the self-employed community in regards to proposed IA35 extension to private sector. The rules prevent contractors working for personal service companies who are in similar roles to employees paying less tax and national insurance contributions than employees. The reform will place the responsibility for assessing whether these rules apply onto the pri private sector end user, so onto you as an employer. Where it is concluded that the client by the client that IR35 applies, the fee payer will become responsible for accounting for it and paying the related tax as well as national insurance con contributions, including the additional cost of employers NIC, directly to HMRC. If you are not fined to be compliant, you might be fined and all the missed contributions will have to be repaid. Due to current circumstances, this reform has been pushed forward to 2020, however, 21, sorry. However, it might be a good opportunity to look into the usual way you engage with contractors and maybe make sure that there is no gray areas in your relationship and that it is clearly defined within the scope of the reform. There are also changes in how we will approach equality in the workplace. The Equality and Human Rights Commission is producing a new set of guidelines that will now be used as an ACAS code of conduct. Although it is not a formal law, it is a best practice you should follow. If you ended up in a tribunal and ended up losing a case, your penalty can be higher if you are found not to have followed those. Employers will have to ensure they are providing team members with training on harassment and discrimination as well, on how to distinguish this, how to spot the signs and how to react shall there be a case internally. There's also be going to be a change in NDAs and settlement agreement in whistleblowing cases, which will now be prevented. And this refers to cases regarding harassment and discrimination. You will also have to think about flexible working as now it is a default scenario. Although in current circumstances it seems like it is a must, going forward you need to ensure that you offer it and if you choose not to, you have to have a very strong business justification for not doing so. In such a competitive environment, it is not enough to only provide the bare minimum though. To gain a competitive advantage, you need to stand out and be able to offer your customers and staff members with something more and with something that your competitors don't. You need to stand out as an attractive employer. It has never been more important to have a strong employer brand to attract key people and to attract top skills. A strong employer brand means that your company is considered as an attractive place to work for with distinctive values, work culture and career prospects. So why does it matter to be an attractive employer? First of all, it does have an effect on your recruitment of good quality candidates and on your staff retention. Many employer brands can be a little fuzzy and classic signs of those and that some sharpening is needed include first of all rising recruitment costs, in particular graduate recruitment costs, lost candidates during selection and high staff turnover rates, especially within 18 months of joining as an employer. You do spend money on recruiting, getting the best talent in your house and training as well as taking care of your employees. So you'd ideally want them to stay with you for a longer period of time. If you do offer competitive benefits and take care of your employees, you would save costs on finding the new ones. Secondly, it does also influence your reputation in the marketplace. Every company has an employer brand, whether they know it, like it or not. It embodies who you are as an organ organization as a place to work. It includes everything an organization says about itself and everything that is being said about it. It's what people think of you, how they feel about you and the perception and the image your organization has. It comes through all sources, often filtered through social networks, and it is as much about engagement and retention as it is about recruitment and promoting yourself. What happens if you don't choose to be an attractive employer? First of all, you're going to have higher operating costs for you as an employer due to poor staff retention and poor candidate attraction. Also, you can be faced with less engage, engaged and committed workforce, decreased productivity, and it will affect your bottom line. So in essence, how much money you make. 
Your customers might also lose their trust to your brand should negative news be a public knowledge. We've seen that happening in cases such as Volkswagen, Sports Direct, and so on. What can you do to become an attractive employer? First of all, you need to ensure that you do provide additional benefits and set clear expectations. You need to make sure that you are paying a fair salary and offering a competitive benefit range. This is an advantage and you can do it via benchmarking, via seeing what other companies in your position offer their employees. However, you need to offer more to give you that competitive advantage. Think about your specific business strategy and culture and about what would fit within this scope. For example, if you want to be seen as a sustainable employer, think about promoting the use of green business cards, healthy living, maybe gym memberships or healthy snacks in the office, as well as some office workouts. You also need to think about training. Provide opportunities for your people. In a small organization, it will not always be possible to make everyone a manager or get them to progress very quickly, but you can still offer training, shadowing and horizontal growth. Think about offering your employees a route of becoming an expert in their area of interest. Allow them time off to gain qualifications that can be used in their day-to-day -day job. And if you can, support the costs. You can also think about defining the corporate social responsibility. It is a way of giving back to the community and taking part in philanthropic causes and providing positive social value. Businesses are increasingly turning to the corporate social responsibility to make a difference and build a positive brand around the company. Think about what you already have in place about work-life balance and flexible working. With the current working environment looking likely to be the new norm, look at the policies you've got and practices in place and think about how you can improve on in communication and what are the support you can offer to your employees when they are working remotely. What ties with that is also looking at the employee's mental health. You need to ensure that you do speak about it and that your employees can still speak to someone in a confidential manner, shall they be feeling down or just needing some extra support. A use of employee assistance program could be beneficial, although if you do not have one in place already, there are also plenty of free mental health support services, such as Able Futures, which is a mental health in the workplace counseling service, and it is run by Department for Work and Pensions. There are also websites with advice run by NHS, which offer well-being advice. Think about your family leave policies that you do have in place already and if they are competitive. If not, you could look at developing those as well as retention practices. It could be a good idea, for example, to introduce increasing days of annual leave and benefits with length of service. And then you can use it as your retention strategy to keep good people and great talent you've got in place already. Remember that becoming an employer of choice is not a task, it is a strategy. Often organizations mistake that brand building is just a specific task such as planning a social network campaign. Instead, it is rather a long-term strategy, so make sure you approach it with clear vision in mind. Assign an own ownership of it and lead it from the top. It should be ideally led by CEO, apply changes and measure how it has influenced your employer branding. Now I'll pass on to Jackie, who will take us through employer basics. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Okay, so if we look at um, employer basics and, and what you really need to do um, in the UK from a, a legality point of view. Um, so first of all, you absolutely need to have an employment contract which is compliant with UK legislation. And as Anna mentioned, uh, recent legislation changes mean that this um, needs to happen from day one of employment at the latest. Um, so as of uh, a development from April 2020, employers did have two months to issue a written statement of terms to new employees. So this is a big change. Um, again, as Anna had mentioned, the contract needs to be um, compliant with UK employment law. And there are some uh, recent additions that have meant that any, any existing templates that you may have in the UK um, will probably need to be updated to comply, comply with the new changes. Um, unfortunately, a employment contract version from a potential parent company template pool will not suffice. Um, and I would also be rather wary of contract templates sourced via Google too. And we have seen quite an array over the years. Um, if we look at company HR policies, 
Um, so as an SME new to the UK, it would not be expected that you would have a wealth of policies and procedures which are compliant with the UK from day one. Um, this is acceptable to be built over time as the business grows and develops. If you're not offering enhanced family leave policies, for example, then it's not a pressing matter to have policies on maternity leave and so on if you're only offering the statutory maternity pay. You do, however, have a legal responsibility to your employees to have clear, accessible guidance on the company processes and procedures for disciplinary and grievance. Therefore, as a minimum, you do need to have those two policies. So for clarity, uh, the disciplinary policy outlines the procedure which the employer would follow should they wish to discipline an employee and the various stages involved. Uh, the grievance policy would outline the procedure for the employee to raise an issue against the employer or an employee of the employer. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that in the case of disciplinary policy, this also allows you to make your own stamp on what you deem to be unacceptable behaviour for the company. Um, so you can shape and mould that policy to, to outline what, um, what conduct matters and so on or, or performance matters that you deem to be gross misconduct. Another policy required by law, if you have five employees or more, is a health and safety policy. Um, so just to bear that in mind. Uh, you should also have a data privacy policy for review and agreement by your new employees so that they are aware of how you handle personal data in the workplace. Um, and this ties into uh, GDPR 2018, um, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, other policies which you may want to consider for a slimmed down policy offering. So just to be clear, this is not uh, a legal matter. It's just something that um, may be good to have if you do want to, to offer a basic offering in terms of policies. Um, so they would be equal opportunities, which includes equal pay, um, sickness, holiday and company benefits. If we look at um, sickness, holiday and benefits policies, um, again, although it's not a legal requirement, they are beneficial to have, um, as even though now, and again, as outlined by Anna, there is ad additional information to be included in the contract of employment on those areas. Having an external policy to the contract, which discusses the further detail on these offerings and any conditions attached or processes, and this will aid you in the argument that some offerings are non-contractual and means that you stand a better chance at being able to vary or withdraw a certain benefit, um, whether that be enhanced sickness or um, holiday and so on. Um, and also, of course, if you don't want to have an even lengthier contract, external policies help here. In relation to the equal opportunities policy mentioned, uh, while failing to have a policy in place is not unlawful, a tribunal would likely take a negative view of this should you have to defend against a claim of discrimination. And this also ties in with what Anna mentioned earlier regarding the guidelines produced by the Equality and Human Rights Commission on harassment in the workplace, where even though this does not form part of UK legislation, uh, certainly should employers find themselves in a tribunal scenario invol involving harassment, then they may find themselves legally liable for harassment in the workplace if they've not taken reasonable steps to prevent it or follow the guidelines produced. So that would include things like training your employees on bullying and harassment um, and having a policy which outlines uh, what behaviours you deem to be unacceptable. In terms of insurances, um, if you have employees, then the one insurance which you absolutely need to have by law is employer's liability insurance. Um, this insurance protects your business against the cost of compensation claims made in the event that an employee sustains an injury um, at work or um, develops a work-related illness. For most businesses in the UK, employers' liability insurance is a legal requirement and not having adequate cover can lead to significant fines. Um, as an employer, you are responsible for the health and safety of your employees while they're at work. So if an employee suffers an injury or falls ill, you may be held liable. Um, it could be something as simple as an injury caused by falling on a wet floor, um, or an employee may contract a disease because of something that you were unaware of. So it really is very important that you have this in place. In relation to benefits, um, it is a legal requirement to offer a compliant workplace pension in the UK. Um, this pension scheme must be compliant with auto enrolment guidelines and registered with the pensions regulator as a compliant scheme. 
Um, this is where you certify how many of your employees are enrolled in the scheme every three years, and there are strict guidelines involved with this. Your employees must all be enrolled into the workplace pension, provided that they meet the qualifying factors. Um, and this loosely includes being aged between 22 years old and the UK state pension age, and uh, minimum earnings uh, must also be £10,000 or more per year. Um, so there are set percentages that um, you must contribute towards the pension scheme as an employer too. Um, other than this, there are no other mandatory benefits in the UK unless you consider minimum sickness pay and paid holiday allowances. Uh, so for your information, they are um, statutory sick pay. So under normal circumstances for statutory sick pay, the first three days of a single sickness period are unpaid. And then from day four onwards, paid at a rate of £95.85 per week. Um, I mentioned normal circumstances as now, due to COVID-19, sickness may be paid at statutory sickness pay rate from day one of sickness rather than day four, um, if the illness is COVID-19 related and if the sickness duration is four days or more. Uh, so the main take home here is that it is not mandatory at any point to pay employees anything if they are sick for a day or so here and there. Uh, statutory holiday allowance as well, the minimum fully paid holiday allowance for a full-time employee is 5.6 weeks for a full-time employee for a full holiday year. So this works out as 28 days inclusive of the UK bank holidays for a full holiday year. Um, so you can choose to offer other benefit insurances such as private medical insurance and life insurance and so on, but it's not a must just to be clear on that point. So if we look at uh, the ever evolving employers landscape, um, what is important to employees today? If we look at the employee reward strategy, we instantly think about salary and benefits. Um, and of course we all have bills to pay. Um, however, we are all incentivized in different ways. In a recent study carried out by CIPD, um, it was found that for companies, the main internal drivers of benefit provision are to attract recruit and retrain, retain the employees needed to support current and future business needs. Um, this was followed by promoting work-life balance and supporting employee health and well-being. The most common external influences on the benefits package are legal and employment obligations and other employment rights legislation. So before introducing revising or removing a benefit, it really is important for the organisation to consider the why um, so why is the organisation introducing and offering the benefit? Um, how is this benefit supporting the organisation's business goals? Um, how does it reward the values and behaviours that the employer needs? In today's employment world, employers are offering a rich and diverse array of benefit types. Um, so this can be um, from traditional benefits such as staff canteen or, or company car to new perks such as nap rooms and um, bring your dog to work days, or employee, allowing employees to take as much paid time off as they want. Um, some benefits have a direct cost for the organisation. Uh, so if we look at things like providing private medical insurance, while others have indirect costs, if we look at um, costs in terms of design, administration and communication. Um, so if we look at um, benefits such as employee networks to support diversity and inclusion being one. However, for the work workforce today, what do employees want? So if we look at millennials in the workplace, um, an array of studies have found that millennials value recognition at work um, in that they want to be recognized for the work that they do. And therefore, if we think of company culture and values, employers should think about how they can align their business with these values. For millennial workers, it's important to have plenty of opportunities to grow in their role as individuals. So absolutely excellent career training and development programs are for them what make an employer attractive. Um, millennials want to be rewarded for their work with avenues for self-improvement, such as learning new skills or, or refining existing ones. Um, they've also been found to respond best when they are recognized at work in a way that is personal to them. So perhaps consider letting employees choose their rewards and make sure to offer a wide range of options which focus on new, unique experiences. 
Um, millennials are also very tech savvy. So access to benefit information 24 seven is a definite plus. Um, so if we think of things like health related mobile apps and wearable devices to manage health, that could be anything like a physical activity or sleep patterns and so on. Um, it's definitely found to be a positive. Flexible schedules have also shown to be important, um, which allow millennials to focus on their work and get things accomplished and then return to their daily lives rather than the routine traditional nine to five. Whatever the age group, employees or candidates could certainly choose a lower salary if the, the wider benefits package and the working environment is outstanding for them personally. Um, of course, that could mean anything to any individual, um, but of course, for employees of all ages, good management and an open, transparent company culture is a given for a good employer. <clears throat> we will no doubt see new norm once the pandemic has passed by, but flexible work in a certain size and it has. Um, so this could be flexible hours or it could be working from home. Um, there's quite a lot that, uh, that sits under there. Of course, now that many businesses have trial run, um, have trial run working from home, it will be harder to, to refuse flexible working requests in future. So businesses really think about keep that structure workable when considering work-life balance and communication challenges. If we look at industry, um, so Google being the poster child of benefit, um, so try not to get too jealous here, but they, uh, they do offer fabulous perks such as free food, uh, cookery classes, on-site gym and classes, um, massage therapists, on-site medical staff. They have uh, very generous family leave policies, um, an extremely generous death benefit insurance, uh, although obviously granted that's not so exciting for the individual. Um, sleep pods, uh, discounts off events, uh, time off for holidays. So the list really is endless. Um, and Facebook, of course, uh, also have very similar in terms of their very generous benefit offering. So of course we appreciate not all business businesses can follow suit, um, but there are some ideas there to take away from some of what's been offered by these tech giants. Um, but depending on your industry and the type of roles which you employ, commonplace benefits can vary. Um, so for instance, no matter the industry, if you are hiring salespeople, then they are likely to place more value on a good bonus or commission scheme rather than private medical insurance or free food. Um, if we look at the issues being faced in the hospitality industry, for one, uh, from data provided by Trade Body UK Hospitality, we know that due to Brexit and the new immigration system, which, it's on, which is on its way, that more than 200,000 job vacancies across the UK will need to be filled due to the many roles in the hospitality industry not qualifying for visa status. So this will be um, due to the new points-based system arriving in 2021. Um, and the low skill label attached to these roles does not make them an attractive option for many companies. Um, so many, many companies in this industry are looking at uh, what soft benefits they can offer to make the roles more appealing to candidates who are already in the UK. Um, also looking at schemes to bring in younger workers to show them the career path in the long term. So really we can see the evidence of, of all sorts of companies who are employing um, techniques such as career development and, um, and other maybe non-cash related benefits to, to make them look more appealing. Um, a well-known pub chain has also uh, created a dedicated scheme to hire ex-offenders as a way to tackle the issue of, of the um, candidate attraction problem. So what next? Uh, well, whenever this pandemic ends, we certainly feel confident that this will push the agenda for flexible working to become the norm. And I think that's become fairly evident um, from everything that we've read in the, pe the press, really, and, and just the way that we're operating at the moment. Um, but this definitely means that for companies who can accommodate home working, uh, this may become the norm. Some businesses are even considering moving to a 100% home working model and ditching their office environment. Of course, no matter the chosen model, communication will become more digitized. Uh, some staff will thrive in this environment, um, some unfortunately may not. But we do know that leaving people without guidance and leadership can lead to undesirable behaviours from cyberbullying and sexual harassment to presenteeism, uh, all of which can lead to a loss of productivity. Um, so that's just something to be cautious of as we are journeying through this, uh, this digital age that we've entered. 
Um, and of course, Brexit. So we have not spoken about this in the press for a while, for obvious reasons. But as Anna outlined regarding being an attractive employer, we perhaps need to attract our British talent, um, bearing in mind the, the visa system that's coming, um, or perhaps arrange a sponsor license. So just some things to think about over the course of 2020. Um, to future proof your business, we really need to make sure that we know what skills that we have in the workplace and where there are gaps in skill set. Um, so this can help you develop part of your business continuity plan. Um, so just to bear that in mind. Um, so thank you. That's all for us from us for now. Um, and we will hand back to the chamber for a Q&A session. Well, thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation. Um, we have a few questions here. So let's start on top here. <clears throat> uh, when putting uh, a play, uh, when putting in place employee benefits, should you engage with your employees and ask them what benefits they would like, or would you recommend offering them a variety of pick from to pick from? I think from, from, from my perspective and also from, from experience, it really does depend on the stage of the, um, of the, the UK company life cycle that you're in. So if you're new to the UK, then sometimes it can be um, a bit difficult to speak to the employees about what they would like, because of course you get a wish list and sometimes you're not able to afford everything that's on that wish list. <laughs> so it can become very difficult um, and can maybe create some level of disappointment. Um, but certainly it's important to find out at the recruitment stage what is important to your employees to, to really understand what's going to make, um, make you attractive as an employer and, and obviously look at what your competitors are doing in the marketplace. Um, a variety is, uh, is obviously great. Um, it really depends on what level, level um, benefits are being considered. So if it's something that is very much financially driven, like a PMI and so on, um, or um, for private medical insurance for those that don't know, or, or life insurance. And obviously that's going to be a direct cost to the company. Um, but if you can look at other things that are, um, you know, more, more soft based benefits like uh, fruit in the office and those sorts of things, then, then of course that's more easily deliverable. I don't know if Anna, have you got any comments to make on that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I fully agree with what you've said. And I think it could be a good idea to actually speak to your employees and provide them with a wide range of it, maybe, and see at see basically your workforce, what stage they are in, what is important to them, because you need to tailor your offer to your employees at the end of the day. There are also things such as, for example, Perkbox, which is an online platform giving you a range and variety of discounts. And depending on what uh, plan you choose to go for, there are more and more of them, but um, they sort of relate to everyday life as well. So any discounts in restaurants, going out and having this little spark of joy. So maybe that could be a good idea as well to offer a range of benefits yeah okay thank you uh, next question what benefits do you think are cost effective for SMEs to put in place for uh, from an administrative and cost perspective so certainly from what Anna has just mentioned uh, perk box is a very um, and other similar type benefit providers are um, certainly very cost effective and easy to put in place um, and it means that the employees do have a wide variety of, um, of benefits to choose from so for example there there is things like such as the likes of uh, free EAP systems on there um, mobile phone insurance um, health related benefits retail related benefits so whatever the employees interests or hobbies may be then they'll they're likely to find something that's going to they're going to find appealing um, so if we're looking at, at um, reducing costs or keeping costs to a minimum while still offering something that's appealing, that, that would be a great option. Um, in terms of, of other elements, you know, um, PMI can be expensive. So I would probably, if, if it is a situation where, where you're trying to keep costs low, then um, I would probably steer away from those sorts of things. Okay, anything else to add? On the, if not, we go to the next question. Uh, I work for a Norwegian SME and we had some problems setting up some benefits for UK employees. 
Is there a work around that we can offer our employees benefit even when we aren't fully set up in the market? So by this, I am assuming that the setup is maybe the parent company has employed some individuals in the UK. So they are working for the, the Norwegian company and there is not a UK presence at this time. Um, and this is something that we do see quite commonly um, where it can be an issue getting uh, insurances like private medical and so on in place because they do need a UK presence and also a UK bank account normally. Um, so in terms of workaround, if those are the sorts of benefits which are, are being focused on, um, then uh, an alternative could always be to provide uh, cash to the employee to, to arrange their own um, insurances themselves. Um, there is obviously the, um, the, the negative element of that whereby the, the monies that are being given to the employees to, um, to arrange those benefits directly um, are taxed as cash because they're taxed through payroll. Um, but that, that would be a, a workable solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, how often do employment law changes happen in the UK and how do they usually get communicated out to employers to make sure everyone is aware of them? So unless, um, unless there is a situation like the current pandemic where we have seen some temporary changes and, and they, um, the, the, the timelines have been uh, sporadic and, and not sort of kept to the norm, um, then normally changes are announced ahead of time and are made in April and in um, October every year. And it's, no, it's always communicated via um, the UK Gov website and via other sort of, you know, um, HR and, uh, and uh, employment law regulated channels. Okay, thank you. Next. What benefits do you think are cost effective for SMEs to put in place? Uh, well, we answered that. I think we've had that one. <laughs> um, uh, I run a small business and my staff invoice me monthly. What are my obligations relating to pension schemes? They have flexible working hours between 15 uh, to 25 a week. One has another business, but one is solely working with me, but registered as sole trader herself? That's quite an important question, actually. Yeah, I, I would say that in this situation, it doesn't sound like this small business has any employees. It sounds like these individuals are actually um, independent workers or, or would like to be seen as such. Um, so whether they be sole traders or whether they are limited company workers. Um, in which case, first of all, this links into the IR35 regulations, which Anna was speaking about earlier. So we really need to look at it and, and to, to run a test to see if they really are true sole traders or um, 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 non-employee individuals um, or whether they should be made employees. Um, if they are truly um, sole traders or independent consultants, then um, obligations for the small business, which they, they would not need to offer a pension scheme because these individuals are not employees. 